welcome everyone to our final event at Low Carbon Workspaces. We've been operating now for about six years, so um, crikey, it's a long time. If you think this is 2017, a lot has changed since then, uh, both environmentally, but I think seismically across the globe, hasn't it, in so many ways. Um, but yes, Low Carbon Workspaces, it was ERDF funding, so this is European Regional Development. European Union. So this effectively was a, a, a legacy pot that we were we were distributing and it would be the final funding. So those who have taken advantage, congratulations. And for those who haven't, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but let's see what else we can bring you. OK, so first and foremost, we'll show you a little show reel. It'll kind of tell you what we've done with the grant far better than I would. Uh, then we're going to look at some achievements, that's achievements from the business, uh, achievements for the local economy, uh, but also for the planet, of course. Um, the beauty of this, this scheme is it supports both business in reducing bills and saving the planet. So it's a very nice one to be a part of and to be an applicant of, I would hope. Uh, then we have the panel discussion with our, our great businesses, excited for that. Then we're going to talk about some further benefits to the business and then, of course, other opportunities in life beyond low carbon, where kind of we go from here and what businesses can consider moving forward in their kind of future transition to net zero and reducing those energy costs. OK, so first and foremost, let's kick off with the uh, video. Um, here we go. It's very difficult to start a project on your own. It's not all about the funding, but it's about someone that can take you by the hand and see you through it, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. The Low Carbon Workspaces team, they were very helpful, very supportive. By completing this project, we've created a much better workplace for our employees. We had a visit from the energy assessor, actually got some good advice from that as well, so it wasn't just about a grant, it was some advice about how we could do energy efficient measures throughout the building. The environmental upgrades we've done have had quite a big effect on running costs. Uh, we estimate about half the running costs on the, on the heating system over the year and about 2.6 tonnes of CO2 saved. It made perfect sense to actually contact the low carbon workspaces and try and see whether we could get a grant for all LED lighting, which was just perfect. The grant actually paid up to a third of the costs, which is huge for us. It really did help support us being able to make the project happen. Getting the grant was doubly helpful really. We were able to use what we saved in fuel to put towards other initiatives. Our customers really appreciate these green initiatives. It does make a difference to people. And so as we grow, we are making sure that we're constantly researching and including green technologies within our business plan and growth. Any businesses um, out there looking at a project like this, I would really recommend that they do reach out. It made all the difference to us and our customers. Brilliant. Let's look a bit more at some of those achievements. Really interesting within the video, one thing that stood out to me uh, was the actual tonnage. And what I really must um, stress is that these are annual savings. So when we say here, 5,067 tonnes of CO2e. As a reminder, the E is for equivalent. So as some of you may know, we've got five or six harmful gases in the atmosphere, but 
just for the ease of conversations like this, we talk about carbon equivalent, but effectively we're talking the same thing, you know, pollution, uh, greenhouse gas effect. Uh, so let's look what that what that actually uh, looks like. Um, so it's equivalent to taking 2,365 cars off the road annually. Again, really must stress that because, of course, the savings these businesses have made are replicated year on year because that benefit is seen in years two, years three, years four, and so on for the full life of the intervention. And when you consider something like solar, we know that solar has a life of 25 years plus, um, and you know it only degrades by as much as you know 20% in that time, but you still get 80% of the return after 25 years. So really significant. Uh, planting 10 hectares of broadly forest annually. So again, this is new new trees every year. There's some um, uh, you know discourse around tree planting at the moment, as you all know. Um, it's not the solution for everything, but of course, this is the alternative, actually reducing the impact we're having, and then we, I guess, have to do less to correct the issue. And out of the three, this is my favourite. It's over 1,500. It's over 1,500 UK homes annual energy use that has been completely removed. So those properties are effectively net zero for the savings that have been made by our brilliant businesses. So this really is meaningful stuff. It's not kind of creative figures. These are you know, science backed, uh, strong, robust projects that has resulted in very real uh, benefits to the businesses. Let's look at them businesses. Well, we've supported over 932 businesses. This is across Buckinghamshire, Hertfordshire, Berkshire, Northamptonshire, Milton Keynes, Bedfordshire. Uh, I think I've got everyone there. If I've missed anyone, I'm very sorry. Don't take it personally. Uh, but a lot of businesses across quite a, quite a large uh, footprint. Uh, we've delivered 1,008 unique projects. Uh, and you think, well, have you only helped 932 businesses? Some of them businesses came back for a second grant to get their allocation. Again, it was great for us because they saw that it worked and thought, we'll, we'll come back to you and use you again. Oh, this is the, the whopper of a figure. The 3.3 million has been distributed to businesses. This is money directly provided to businesses for these uh, acquisitions. I think it's really good that we can also say that figure has been increased because we were able to run the programme more efficiently, reduce our operational costs, and as a result, we could move even more funds into grant funding. So giving more businesses the funding beyond what we originally um, stated we would do. And we've done that purely because we know this is you know, the, the real benefit. Um, so uh, by us running more efficiently, we could in turn give more money out uh, to local businesses, which of course has had a strong impact. So the saving, of course, it's not just the reduction of that upfront cost. The, the whole reason many businesses do this is for the reduction in energy bills and their um, utility costs. On average, businesses have saved £2,350 a year. And again, I really must stress it's a year. So this is savings year on year. Long after they've forgotten about making the purchase, the hardship of paying for it and feeling that on their bank balance, well, actually, it's pretty quickly um, wiped out with such strong return on investments. And GVA, gross value added. So effectively, this is just looking at for every pound we've spent on the programme, what added value is there to your to businesses, to the local economy? And that's three pounds fifty two um, at our last reckoning. It's going to be higher than that now because this was calculated, um, to be honest, before the sting of the energy costs. So this will be even greater now. Of course, as energy costs go up, that makes it worse for the business. But if you can understand it as a programme, we, of course, help then reduce savings even further. A uh, couple more for you here. So um, what have we done with this money? What have businesses done with this money? 26,000 LED bulbs. I had Ab from our team count them all up. We've got 26,000. So, yeah, I have to say the most popular of uh, interventions is LED lighting. I think it's around 49% of our applications and our um, approved grants were for LED lighting. That was not us preferencing them. It was just because this is very much where the demand is from business. LEDs are a lower, um, a much lower upfront cost as 
compared to some other interventions. Usually um, the work that goes into them is far less, uh, far less intensive. Um, and what's more, they use day in, day out. So the return on investment for LEDs can be three to six months even. So really, really low. And that's why half the businesses went for it. Uh, it also obviously has the added benefits of making a nicer working environment. The bulbs last far longer. Uh, 100 solar arrays. So um, again, this is our second most popular project, as you can imagine. This really, so 2017 to 2020, we would have some applications for solar, but crikey, in the past two to three years, certainly linked with the horrific energy crisis, um, we have seen the uptake of solar really kind of hockey stick up. Um, it's It's been stunning for us, actually, how many people are investing in solar. Um, it's brilliant. Um, we'd say, obviously, start with the LEDs. Uh, that's in reducing your energy is more important than creating it. Um, in the first instance, or rather you can do it more cost effectively, but creating your own energy, improving the energy security, you know, we uh, so much is happening at the moment, as we all know globally, um, that we're in um, very unusual times and actually having that energy security, depending less on the grid or other countries for this is, is definitely going to safeguard you in, you know, an uncertain future. 70 glazing projects, so double glazing, triple glazing. It's interesting, some of the schemes that operate around the country, similar to ours, um, excluded uh, excluded glazing, which to us was always strange. It's because um, relative, the investment to the carbon saving isn't considered to be as high as some other interventions. But what we have to remember is by 2050, 80% of the building stock so buildings that currently exist, 80% will still exist in 2050. We will be in them buildings. So four out of five of us right now, well, it's biz in business units, but uh, four out of five will still be standing. We need glazing. Graph proofing is so important um, to reduce heat use, but what's more, it's also um, for staff, uh, it has huge impacts. And also we've had businesses who've transformed the front of their operations visually and it, it's completely transformed that kind of um, the portrait of the of the business when consumers customers arrive so you know again it, it's about the benefits beyond the carbon as well but still really important to do if if you're in that position 61 air and ground source heat pumps you will have been hearing a lot about this in the news um, and you will continue to hear a lot that you know this is the future we'll get them in our homes etc um, they're very good to be utilised in some instances, not as good in others. It's all dependent on um, the the user, but certainly for businesses with a bit more space, a bit more energy use, it's a fantastic approach. And 61 businesses actually took that up, which we're really, really pleased about. Uh, 54 buildings insulated, pretty straightforward. Again, go back to that 80% of building stock. Insulation is so important and long lasting. Um, Again, it really helps encapsulate the heat. 33 equipment upgrades. So we know that, you know, we, we help so many sectors. We've got so many unique businesses. They're on the call today. Some of the panelists are an example of that and we'll kind of share with you what they've done. But we also have helped with specialist equipment. So we've not wanted to turn away people just because we don't understand the technology. You all come from your own sectors and subsectors. Um, and we've always been happy to research find a good science base and in turn support that project. So we're really happy that we could do that. It would have been easy to say, oh, sorry, it's not a conventional saving, but we think that would have been really demoralizing for the company who'd actually thought of something that's perhaps more unique. Um, so of course we want to support it. 16 compressors, boring and ugly compressors, but I'm telling you, if if you've got an in, uh, inefficient one, you can lose about 80% of the power in um, wasted energy. They are power hungry. Any of you who are in manufacturing, use compressors, you know um, the damage these do. Of course, they're important, integral, but actually getting those upgraded made a huge difference. And this one always makes me smile. Um, of our uh, 1008 project supported we have one turbine which we're really really happy about um you know everyone's got their opinions but we certainly uh, see wind as being a key technology and it's just fantastic that someone could actually use this grant 
to support uh, the in installation of the wind turbine. We may be hearing a bit more about that though, uh, coming up shortly. So I've kind of gone through there the carbon impacts, but there are achievements that we've kind of done beyond that as well in the projects we've assisted. So we've reduced water by 48.5 million litres. Um, this is not annually, this is over the life of the programme. So big number, it's probably what Thames lose in uh, half an hour through leaks. Uh, but it, we're still really, really happy about this. And again, it shows our thinking beyond the, you know, the energy bill, the gas and electric, but actually also water, the carbon impact of water, which very much exists. And some businesses, of course, depend far more on water than others. For some of us, it's just a case of staff washing hands. Um, whereas for some businesses, um, you know, actually recycling that water, using it again in their operations is really important. Uh, 6,825 tonnes of waste diverted from landfill, weight of the Eiffel Tower. I'm sorry these are very cliché. Uh, we've had Olympic-sized swimming pool and Eiffel Tower. I, if you were going to take a bet, I think you'd think double-decker bus was going to come next as a comparator, uh, but it won't. But it's just to exemplify, actually, how much waste has been diver diverted from landfills. This is where we've supported projects towards a company's waste management strategy. So again, carbon saving is huge, but Cracky, think of that. That's 7,000 tonnes not going to landfill that's being reused. So um, health benefits are, are clear and explicit there. Oh, no, it wasn't the double decker. It was the Golden Gate Bridge. So we've got 450,000 litres of solvent-based paint. Um, again, this was a specialist project we assisted the business with. But I, I don't think I have to add anything to that for you to appreciate um, what that means, the, you know, the, the chemicals. The, the impact, the carbon impact of chemicals is is monstrous, depending on what the chemicals are. And of course, solvent based <laughs> paints we know are particularly harmful. So this is great stuff. And lastly, 360,000 litres of diesel, which is equivalent to 20 tank trucks full. Um, this is brilliant. We often think you all, you know, we can, it's very easy to think, right, we make these savings. We don't see the impact these have. We think perhaps the energy is produced elsewhere. So we, we aren't taking in these emissions. Well, actually, that's 360,000 litres of diesel that would have been burned within our respective areas. So this is air that you would all be breathing in. And we know that World Health Organization say our lives are already reduced on average in the UK by about one and a half years that we just lose um, because of the atmosphere. Um, so the, these projects are really helping on the street where these businesses operate. This isn't about developing further afield. This is on the doorstep. So I think that really highlights the relationship there and actually how close to this we are. Um, so, yeah, they were superb savings. Right, this is enough of me now. Let's get some more interesting people into the room. So we are, I'm going to, I'll say, uh, introduce everyone we've got now and then I'll turn to each of you and uh, we'll take it from there again if there's any questions for any of the panelists as well as we go pop them in the chat and Megan will be sure we shout up about them so yes we have John Carter will uh, be saying hello shortly he's from Carter Electrical John's very interested in that he um, he will tell you but provider of LEDs um, so he's both been a recipient of the scheme but also he's helped all the businesses some of them businesses may be in the room uh, with their projects which um, we've had some suppliers who've certainly taken advantage of the scheme worked hard to make sure the savings were robust and accurate as John's an example of so we'll hear more from him we have Datis Gov um, Datis is from Bookstore Beer a brilliant company doing some really marvellous things for the environment or their considerations of how they're running their operations and uh, taking steps to do that. So nice, interesting business. Uh, Andreas, uh, we have from Total Carbide. Andreas has a real interesting project to talk about. I think it's interesting. Um, so it'll be great to hear from Andreas. Uh, and last but not least, we have Simon Newell from Chilton Young Riders. Um, Simon uh, will be talking to us perhaps about that wind turbine. Uh, so great, John, first and foremost, it'd be lovely if you could introduce yourself, perhaps tell us what you used your grant for, um, and then any other insights that you might have. Um, hi guys, yeah. Um, we, yeah, we've helped a lot of people with the grant and then um, got to a point 
at the start of the year that we needed to sort out our heating system in the office. So um, I just I chatted to Dan and said, oh, can we actually use it for um, sticking a heat pump in uh, at our offices and some extra solar panels to um, help help reduce reduce the carbon footprint and um, get some cheaper energy into the house, uh, into the building. And when was it you installed that, John? A um, couple of months ago. So, uh, so after March, winter think... of 2022, wasn't it? Yes, yes. So you felt effectively to the sting of two winters um, with the horrendous kind of uh, energy rises. Um, so it'll be really interesting for yourself to see at the end of the year as you come into that uh, winter season, just kind of what those impacts are. Yeah, the, uh, so, the solars, the solars worked really well. Um, yeah, the the electricity side has dropped quite a lot, and yeah, with the heat pump, we're using no gas now, so um, it's it's already it's already helped quite significantly. And yeah, um, as much as I want the yeah, winter to come to to see how well it's going to look, I'm quite enjoying the sunshine at the moment. <laughs> quite right, yeah. I won't wish it too soon, John. John, thank you very much. Uh, we also have in the room Datis, as I said. Datis, uh, thank you very much for joining us. So, yes, tell us about Bookstar Beer and uh, tell us what project we helped you with. Hi, yes. Um, so I'm the director of Buckstar Beer. We have a brewery where we uh, brew pure beers using organic grains whilst embracing environmental principles. Um, the brewery uh, is covered with solar panels and then post COVID we opened up a brewery tap house directly opposite, which is the hospitality side of the business and we wanted solar panels for there. And that's when uh, Engage, um, uh, th yeah, I think it was, yeah, Engage who uh, provided the grant to cover the roof with solar panels at the tap house as well. So we did that um, just before the energy crisis um because we're a hospitality business it means we use energy in the evenings and obviously um energy is produced during the day so what we did um soon after is installed batteries so all the energy that the solar panels produce during the day we then can use in the evening and um we, we're already starting to see some savings um so it's it definitely has been a good investment it's marvellous. And the fact you got those batteries after installing the solar will really kind of compound uh, those benefits, won't it? It'll mean that you take full reward rather than the energy companies. Um, exactly. If you can capture on site, um, it's not right for everyone, but as Datis rightfully points out, he's operating a lot in the evening, so he's really power hungry in the evening as well. So for himself, it's certainly worth saving that rather than uh, of course, purchasing it at the current rate that we're seeing. So thank you, Datis. That's brilliant. Uh, Andreas, um, I feel like I, I, I had the privilege, didn't I, of, of seeing you yesterday and walking around and seeing some of the great things you're doing at Total Carbide. Uh, it'd be brilliant. Tell us what Total Carbide do, Andreas, and tell us how you used the low carbon grant. Oh, you might be muted. Uh, let me. Of course, always the same. Um, yeah, so we are tungsten carbide manufacturer. We are uh, we belong to the metallurgy really, and we use a lot of energy. And um, we already had LED lighting. We moved into Westcott Venture Park seven years ago, and when we fitted out our twenty nine thousand square foot factory, we already put in LED lighting, uh, the solar panels on the park, and the landlord doesn't allow us to have our own. Basically, if if someone gets the car and they get the saving as them, and then they sell us the energy. So solar wasn't an option. We've got double glazing in our offices. Um, and so um, but, but I had one area with, which always sort of angered me a bit. We have compressors, and compressors need to be cooled. And basically, that air goes to waste. Um, the compressors are in a, in a D2, quite big compressors. And so I... Um, always wanted to put some ducting in there to get the heat uh, in winter back into the building. And and the problem was um, how to calculate the carbon saving from the hot air that goes into the building. 
and that's where low carbon workspaces was really helpful. They put someone on the case and it took him took him quite a while to con convert basically the uh, kilowatts uh, of the uh, of the compressors and then how much heat is coming, uh, how much arrives. But then in the end, so we had that all winter and that uh, saved me approximately 12,000 liters of fuel. So these buildings are heated with some oil burners and I didn't buy any this winter. I just had the heat coming in the building. I didn't know, we didn't know if it would be enough, but um, yeah, that was very good. Thank See, you very much. I, I, Andres undersells just how um, impacting this has been um, it, it, in his typical humble way. Um, if you can appreciate these com compressors, the hot air they blow out, I mean, the work Andres and his team are doing is quite power hungry just by the nature of the industry he's in. And if you stand behind one of these and feel the heat that's blasted out of them, it's incredible. And this is blasted out by every business who's manufacturing, who's using these compressors, just blasted out into the atmosphere. So you've got this weird situation where we're creating this heat. We need heat, but actually we're just laying it straight out all the while on the other side of the building, burning, what, 12,000 litres of oil. Um, Andreas has just managed to completely eradicate those that that oil use. So, yeah, which, so basically by it, not having to heat it, that's right. Which is um, just superb. So it's effectively free energy or energy that would have been wasted. So that's superb, Andreas. Uh, finally, uh, uh, last but certainly not least, we have Simon Newell on the call. Uh, Simon, uh, it's brilliant to 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 see you uh, from Chilton Young Riders. Um, it'd be really good if you could just give us a little about what Chilton Young Riders do and the, the project you you installed. Oh, you just might be muted. Uh, my apologies, Simon. Oh. oh no, it's okay. Uh, Megan, can you potentially unmute uh, Simon manually, please? I'm unable to uh, unmute manually. I'm afraid. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I'm not able to either. I wonder, uh, Simon, if you right click on your image, can you, um, is the unmute button there or anything? On the top right, there should be a microphone button next to camera. Mm, very good. Thanks, Megan. And share. What I will do, Simon, as to not put pressure on you, because if I was Simon now, I'd be throwing everything off the table thinking oh my god uh, so what we'll do sam now i'll just move on and we'll continue the conversation and then i'll loop you back in in a couple of minutes so let's do that so no pressure simon you try and figure it out um brilliant so i guess i'll i'll head over to you again john um it's interesting your background because of course you've you care about your own energy use and you support your users with their energy use i guess for your demographic your client base is that something that is an important consideration the environmental impacts what do you think is driving businesses to you know to install leds at the the level we're seeing what's the key driver there do you believe i think it's a combination of both um okay people care about their carbon footprint um as but with the energy prices going up the, it, it's also um that that's a big driver as well that if they can bring their energy costs down whilst doing their bit to to save carbon um and it also looks good on the business that they're actually wanting to make a difference i guess be it, everyone wants to see a company that's a bit greener um you, you looking for contracts or clients that that want that actually look at that as well so if everyone can do a little bit it, it's going to make a large difference and um, I, I, yeah. I hinted on it before and i know on the the program um something that we experience all the time is perhaps um, a nervousness and apprehension of businesses um that what they are being sold certainly i'm not putting that this at your doorstep john but um what they're being told by a supplier may be over egged so the savings may not be as grand as are being stated is there anything a business can do to try and, I guess, not protect themselves, but when they approach suppliers 
understand perhaps be empowered in or yeah. understanding what that saving would be what what should they look out for yeah I, it's the old double glazing sales and i always re relate it to is i, I think that, that bugs cool, that, yeah. that does bug me a lot and we always try and under under sell and if people have an idea of how much energy a light bulb's using or um i don't know a, a boiler how much gas or inefficient it might be just just the basic sums on there and it's it's not too hard to to get a basic idea of how much you can save and then yeah with led light bulbs it, it just it, it escalates quite quickly um when you look at the saving especially in a business that uses them all like eight 12 hours a day and yeah, absolutely. In some businesses, I mean, it's 24 uh, seven, isn't it? Yeah, of yeah. course. I think what I would definitely say on top of what John said is um, approaching a supplier who is willing to create these savings to demonstrate these savings to you is also a real good uh, sign uh, as to the supplier and what they do. So, of course, you are looking for overstated values, but you certainly want some form of uh, assessment to know what you're doing, to know the impact you're having there. Uh, great. And in that time, Simon, uh, thank you very much. I've got you unmuted now. Apologies for that. So please tell me okay. about Chilton Young Riders. Uh, can, and the... can everybody... Yeah, can everybody hear me first? Of all? We can hear you beautifully, Simon. Uh, so please tell right. us about yourself and the project yeah. you installed. Right. OK, so basically we are a site that's been operational for about 34 years. Uh, we teach kids predominantly all issues, all stages of life from about four years upwards to adults as well. Um, so we're quite busy we, you know, over the kind of 34 years, we've filled the Albert Hall about five times over um, with kids that we've taught through here. So we've used petrol bikes we there's no electric bikes really that would do the job yet so we use quite a lot of fuel carbon fuel so we thought well you know let's have a little look at see what we can do to kind of offset that and we have 17 acres of broadleaf woodland which absorbs obviously co2 um, we put solar panels in three years ago didn't get an end gauge grant because we'd done it before we knew about them uh, which was a shame we missed that one but um, they sit there doing their thing but what really frustrated the hell out of me was seeing one two three percent generation during the winter night times stormy you know on the cameras you'd see the wind blowing like hell um, and nothing happening from the solar and so I thought, well, we've got to do something about that so I looked into a wind turbine we're in a high-low wind zone. All the planning restrictions uh, mean we've got to increase the, the substance of the buildings to cope with that, which is a bit odd at the time, but it's kind of paid out well. Um, so there are, there's a graph around the country where you either fit in or you don't fit in um, to whether it's economical to put a wind turbine in. We we didn't, it was about four and we were about 4.9. So it, you know, that, that was one of the first prerequisites that we had to come to terms with. Um, then I started looking around for costings um, before I went to the, the grant people. They were expensive things. Um, so I went, obviously it was new technology. I didn't know what pitfalls I was going to hit. So I was looking at the cheapest one, the smallest one, which generates three kilowatts an hour. Full, full go um, but it does it all day long and when the wind's blowing it, it doesn't stop because the sun goes in it goes along all night long and I'm relishing the next few days to see what uh, what we get in the way of the high high wind warning um, but you know the <laughs> it, it all seemed like this is a great idea and then I started to say look, looking in at the cost suppliers hardly any up in Scotland um, Difficult people to not only <laughs> deal with, but slightly difficult on the phone sometimes to understand the accents. It's um, the geographical distance it, for installing yeah. something like this is tough. Yeah, lack of electricians and any solar people didn't want to take it on. I had to kind of 
coerce one new guy into solar to take the take the plunge and then we worked with it together to get it installed i did everything else i built the i did the excavations i did the rebar making of the the cage 12 tons of concrete um installed the whole thing um all the cable just didn't do the wiring up um so that's doable for people if you've got the space you've got to think carefully where you're going to put it um but what another major problem is the planning prejudice if you look on the chiltern area of outstanding natural beauty planning portal you will see there is a presumption against wind turbines and i wrote to my mp and i have them down and i've raised merry hell about this because i think it's disgusting but anyway that's beside the point so i then had to go for planning we're in the green belt and the aomb um so they were doing everything they could to reject it fortunately it had a building on site that was going to be high enough to make something worthwhile putting in but i knew i'd have to extend it another meter and a half because i've just put up a new building that's going to take quite a bit of its um, vortex out when uh, create a vortex for it. When it it, it certainly sounds a complex project. I didn't realise just how many moving parts there were there. So once you'd actually managed to get it installed, how soon after is it that you see the benefits of the of the well, of the wind power? Well, you know, I mean, it when it when it ticks over. You see, the thing is, with solar, you don't really see it moving. You've got the solar panels there. You know, you get a hot day and you see a lot of generation, 25 uh, kilowatts an hour, um, 25 kilowatt hours over the day. Lovely. Um, when it's a cold day or a wet day or a day like today, you know, you look on it, it might be only producing, I don't know, 30, well, say 10 kilowatts over the day. But with the wind turbine, you see it actually static lit static or you see it moving and really the wind turbine is about a winter project um i think somebody mentioned earlier they were looking forward to trying their heat pump out you know well you know it's even a longer game than that you know if you ask yeah. me next year what you know how's it going i can tell you well, at the moment i've put lots of nice you know sign writing on it and it looks really brilliant and it and it does a major PR job as far as parents are concerned. And, you know, and then when it's blowing all night long, um, then that's great. The other uh, problem uh, that you have, Yeah, please, Sam. Go on, I can go on all day, but... Um, no. Bats, bats, bats are a yes. big problem. <laughs> bats are a big problem. So, yeah, so you have to you have bat surveys and God knows what, because they, they say they're going to chop them up, although they've got very flawed evidence to produce that. And I think that will get whittled away over time. So yes. <laughs> put, in, put lightly, why am I the only one that's done it? Because it's not for the faint hearted. I, I would it's agree with that, Simon. I think we all ad admire and can appreciate it would have been challenging to get over the line. And obviously, I can't comment too much on the political side of things. But in answer, it, you know, to add to your point, wind is absolutely essential in the future of the UK's energy security. So I would just say brilliant that you've made your contribution, Simon, as an early adopter. It is harder and it is harder for someone who's, you know, not within that industry. So uh, really have to say we admired you on the team because you, you spent a lot of time on this to get it over the line. So uh, that's some great, great stuff. Um, Andreas, I'm coming back to you, if that's OK. Um, your approach was novel because, of course, you captured that that heat um, that was being lost. The problem is, how do you how did you identify? That? How do you know what's wrong? How do you know without knowing? What was it that made you perhaps consider that as opposed to not getting a heat pump? Yeah, yeah what's wrong is, is uh, you know your business, don't you? And you go around and, and you, you always look where you can make some savings. So you don't initially think of the carbon footprint. You initially think of electricity costs us up, fuel costs us up, and somewhere hot air is blowing out, or you you may have a business with chillers where you chill something, and then the air that gets chilled where it needs to be cold, it gets blown out somewhere. And um, 
and and yeah, that way, uh, just common sense really. Um, so, and it, it, it's a simple answer, isn't it? You know your business. No one knows your business better than you. And whilst you may not feel empowered on the environmental journey, you know operationally what you're doing, or you can walk around your site and look. It is as simple as that. And I have to say, when we do site surveys, uh, when me and the team go out to businesses, that's what we do. We're just practically looking around and thinking, what's that and what could it be replaced with? And I'd also say a lot of the staff in your companies will probably know of these things too, because they might be operating that machinery. They might be sitting where the heat's blasting them in the face and they're having the window open at the same, same time. So common sense, um, Andreas, is I think a, a thing that, that should prevail. Um, I'm interested, Megan, do we have any questions from the audience at large uh, for any of the panellists? If not, I've got a couple more, but I think people would prefer their questions than mine. I've been looking in the chat. We've got some great questions. Um, we have from Ali Khan about uh, whether grants are still available. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, yes, I. Are grants still av available? Unfortunately, as we all know, we've left the European Union and this was um, kind of the, the remaining funds. Uh, so unfortunately, as we have left the Union, we will not be able to access um, support towards these interventions, that being support with upfront cost for businesses moving forward. It's something we're, of course, uh, disappointed about because we recognise that this really is a stimulator to get businesses moving and at the end of the day you're facing such heinous times right now when it comes to costs that you need all the support and actually if you're given that support now you'll need less support in the future because you will have that energy security um so as for future grants we're not seeing anything today appearing from central government or any of the other funders that's not to say we're not looking i can really stress that engage and bbf uh, you know, we're the same. Uh, Engage BBF will will absolutely be striving for any funds that become available for this. Uh, we are going to be putting in for and uh, doing our best to get. But it's likely that a lot of the support moving forward for businesses will be around advice, transitioning to net zero, but without the capital uh, benefits of you know kind of that that injection into your acquisition, which is really unfortunate. Um, we believe there's so many on the list that would not have moved forward with their project. We know that. Uh, we know the level of businesses that could not have afforded to move forward, really, without this support to, to, to implement that technology. Um, so I'm afraid it's a long answer to say, no, there isn't. Um, but very good question. And we will shout from the rooftops when that funding may come back in. Um, yes, and if you're looking as as well, let us know. Uh, superb. Megan, any more questions? Uh, Margaret Rooney for John Carter. Did you replace a gas boiler with a heat pump? Yes. Yeah. We um, yeah we took took out the the gas boiler um, and actually put in um, so an air, air conditioning. So it's heat pump, but it can cool as well, which which worked out. Um, quite nice and the offices made it a lot more comfortable for the staff um but yeah we we fit heat pumps um anyway as part of the business so we, we've uh, replaced quite a lot of uh heat pumps in customers houses straight straight onto radiators um uh, so a lot of the radiators might need upgrading but um demystify what you're reading in the paper they actually work really well um I, I changed my house over to fully electric at the start of the year and um, been quite pleased with how everything's performing through the, the cold spots we had um, uh, at the start of the year. So don't believe everything that you uh, read in the sun. Um, it's uh, it, it's you quite happy to give people advice, show them data um, about how this stuff actually really works. Um, and yeah, the the electrification is going to is a growth growth area and there's lots of opportunity for businesses and people to save save money out there and not all of it involves a big capex cost there are a lot of um especially for businesses um rental or lease options that you can do with the stuff so don't necessarily be worried about that big capex cost up front 
And I guess the beauty there, John, is then as you go and realise those savings, that in turn can help to pay for the the, the oh, product. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so and it, it, yeah, totally. And it snowballs because once people see that it works, then they tell a couple of friends, and yeah, it it it's, it does does really snowball. I'd say, and John can't say, being a supplier, that it very much comes down to the supplier. I think where you hear of those bad news stories, it's probably been the result of that end of things, uh, rather than the technology being, um, you know, what we need in the future. Well, now, for the future. Uh, brilliant, John. More questions, Megan? Uh, Barry and Ian have asked, could you tell us more about the energy assessor? An energy assessor, absolutely. Um, energy assessor, uh, that, uh, in terms of someone assessing a site, I'm, I'm guessing, to kind of consider the environmental uh, footprint uh, where improvements could be made. So if that's for business, we certainly can help. We are continuing in our position at Engage BBF. So we are here. There's four permanent staff members who are part of the environmental team. And we really are happy to help businesses across the board with whatever they need environmentally. We, we have that support. We do have new programmes coming down the line, which also can uh, provide that support as part of uh, those future opportunities. And by future, I'm talking weeks. Uh, these future opportunities that will be coming up um, will uh, assist in uh, assessing sites in reducing um, problem waste, zombie waste, anything like that. Zombie energy waste, that being energy that's left on and we don't know it's on. Um, it, so, uh, yes, it is something we can do. Um, if it's the case that anyone wanted that domestically, an energy assessor, it is not something that we provide. We're very much focused on the business end of things. Uh, however, we do um, give a lot of advice for home working uh, because we recognise the, the importance that's having on the strategy of businesses moving forward. Um, however, there are assessors. If you wanted that domestically, I'd say give a Google, depending on what area you're in. And there are schemes uh, in each of the surrounding counties. If you struggle to find one, feel free to drop us a line if you wanted that for domestic reasons. And we can provide you with kind of a, a free opportunity there of someone who could support. Megan, please, any other questions there? Last but no means least, uh, Matthew has asked, has the panel uh, got any experience of biodiversity being used to reduce carbon, uh, for example, green reefs? Superb. So that's a nice one for the panel. If uh, Andreas, Datis, John or Simon, if you have any views there on biodiversity, I mean, Simon, I think uh, your site looks extremely biodiverse, if I may say so, uh, by the nature of what you do. Um, is that something I guess it's difficult for you to account for the benefits, isn't it? And um, calculate them, uh, but you can know those benefits exist and still promote them. Is that how you see it, Simon? Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, we, could, we can only do what we can do within the confines of what we're given. You know, if we get electric bikes in the future, that are, are, will do the job for us, then it would be that would be lovely. We'll be as much as possible out of the petrol game. Um, yeah, I, I I hear you. I think what's also good to add to that, to, to when it comes to biodiversity, is actually, you know, a lot of businesses can 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 encourage biodiversity. For instance, if you've got a small couple of meters squared uh, grass area, uh, mm. you know, off your car park or something, plant wildflower. Um, something as simple as that is, is an improvement that someone was disagreeing with me then to planting wildflowers. I was thinking, who disagrees with that? Um, it's great. It makes your business look nicer. Clients, customers absolutely recognise these steps. Um, and it makes it nice for the employees to further the costs of, you know, implementing something like that are really, really low. Um, so it's a really important one. Biodiversity is something that's not down the list and there's been a lot of focus on carbon and of course carbon's what we do as a programme. But carbon is just one piece of the puzzle and mm. it's great saving carbon but we also have to care for the, the nature and the biodiversity because that too will indirectly impact the carbon that's sequestered. Uh, so it's a really, really good point and I'd say if anyone is struggling on the 
capital acquisition yeah. side of things to make purchases. Looking at biodiversity is a nice area uh, with lower lower costs. Um, I think someone mentioned green roofs as well. Very novel. I don't have a lot of experience with them. Uh, I am aware of a business who does them and uh, they, they're fantastic. I mean, they do help. Um, of course, there's a cost associated there. I think it depends on the kind of environment you're in. If you're in quite an urbanised area, there's even more benefit. I personally would think if you're kind of in a rural based area for cost value, you could probably do other things in a living roof. Then again, the I guess the PR element, something Simon pointed to with his 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 wind turbine, the PR element is still really super, isn't it? Um, so really, really good question. Megan, did you say one more question had come through? There are actually two more now. So oh, Caroline has asked, um, are grants available through the scheme for academies? Uh, which I think Tom has just answered. Tom, and uh, this is said, can green roofs help with insulation? Can green roofs help with insulation? Um, I I don't know. Uh, I don't know. So I'm not going to just take a stab. I would say um, the effectiveness of internal insulation is really strong and the life of that insulation will be very lengthy. So I would say first and foremost, ensure that you have got good insulation um, because nothing could do the job as well as a material that's been designed for that purpose. Uh, but it's an interest, definitely an interesting point. I'm not sure it's one I will ask uh, next time I speak to uh, my living roof guy. Um, any other questions, Megan? No, uh, someone's, uh, Karen, I just asked Tom, uh, does anyone know of any other schemes that might be available? It's, and it's Haram has just said, which one will be the best to have a solar roof or a green roof? <laughs> uh, solar, personally, if if I may just say solar, you, you, the benefits you will see, the financial benefits to begin with, but actually the impact you will have, uh, that reduction will be very meaningful. So I would really implore solar uh, out of those two options. Uh, but those who get a, a living roof, really, really smart and we love seeing them and I do think it's it's great promotion, uh, certainly. Um, so, and Matthew, quite right. Why not do hybrid? Why not have both? Absolutely. The best solar is solar that is surrounded by biodiversity. So um, a really good one to add there, Matthew. Thank you. That, I just saw that pop up. Right, I will move on. That was really uh, engaging, but I'll, I will move on just because of time. We'll be going for another 15 minutes, uh, but I promise you there's nothing to stressful or arduous in it. Um, so everyone can see the slide still, can't they? Um, OK, so hope no one minds out of the four businesses. Uh, I'm really sure you won't because uh, we've asked you in the past, but these are the certificates we were able to provide to the businesses. So not only did they get, um, of course, the, the help towards their project, they also get a certificate, which I don't know if you asked them. I, I don't know what they put more value on, the certificate or the financial saving. Uh, however, the certificates is something that whilst yes a little cheesy with the animals we know that it's something that businesses have really engaged over uh it's something they've been able to sell to their customers uh, because when they say to their customers we saved um you know 2.2 tons 1.7 14.3 or one ton a client or customer is going to say great i don't know what that means well actually at least with the whale it kind of it's a, a nice, friendly way they can get across um, what they've done. I would also say no one should get hung up on what the tonnage saving is with these. Different interventions have different impacts. Of course they do. Um, and it's not to say that the link is explicit, that the one that saves the most tonnage will save the most money. That's not the case. They can't. There is a correlation, uh, but it's certainly not um you know predetermined to be that way these projects were the right projects for the businesses uh, that took them out that's the key it's the important part of this but it's also important to acknowledge when you do these things and these savings um and then you can you know you can promote this to your contacts you can share this with customers in a social media post and it will you know you will get engagement Historically, we used to have, I think, a little bit of a fear that businesses would be worried that they'd be accused of greenwashing and, you know, selling selling this when they're not actually that clean. Actually, I think we've seen, certainly for SMEs, small and medium-sized businesses, 
customers are more forgiving than that. They want to see if there's genuine movement that you're doing, genuine steps that you're taking. They want to know um, and they're not certainly going to come down on you um, for that. So make sure you really promote what you do here. And that's something that we knew. It's kind of the final piece there to, to get that message out. We also did green diagnostics, so we did site surveys. We did a few hundred of these visiting businesses, not all took a grant, but it allowed us to go around the site, make personal recommendations for them uh, that would affect them in their sector. What's more, we gave that journey to net zero. A lot of businesses said, great, we've taken the grant, we've got the money. What now? We, we don't know where to go from here. So we really tried as the pro programme kind of evolved, we tried to um, make sure this was not a means to an end flash in the pan, but actually it was a, a meaningful start to their transition. So we we really tried that and we've we've got very real examples of where that's happened, countless examples. So it's another thing we're proud of. Um, uh, Caroline asked, are we still able to support with diagnostics? Yes, that is something we will be able to continue, uh, Caroline, and something that will be supported in a very, uh, you know, kind of an opportunity soon. Uh, so yes, watch this space. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say about helping businesses determine the approach. This is something else we have done and can do, and it's something you should do in your businesses. This is very much what Datis, John, Simon and Andreas did. They considered, right, well, what's important to us? Now, if you draw your own radar graph, it doesn't have to be a graph. All we're doing is putting some consistent comparisons across these technologies to see what is most important to us. You know, some businesses, understandably, will value kind of cool factor that, you know, front end, the pizzazz it gives. Um, so that could be important. Some others, it might be the upfront investment. Whatever it is, this is what you need to do. This is Andre spoke again of common sense. And again, I'll say this is common sense. This is looking at your business and think, well, what does it mean to us? And just rate them one to ten. And that will really help just getting down on paper to see, well, what's our priority here? And, you know, how do we wish to move forward? Um, so life beyond low carbon. As I've said, we're hoping that we're going to have a couple of programmes uh operational soon that we're excited about and we're really going out for so many different opportunities we now have a, a real strong permanent environmental team within the company that will remain there um we've worked with you businesses for so long now that it's important we um we keep that uh you're most welcome that is uh it's great the businesses that have been involved have really you know made some magic and we'll continue to do that Exponential roadmap is somewhere that uh, a consideration people can have. What we will do, what we do as an organisation and us getting to net zero is all around the one and a half degree business playbook. So I'd really say if any of you are interested, please go onto the SME Climate Hub, which is what you see now. Have a look on there. A brilliant list of kind of um, pools, resources for SMEs. Uh, really worth checking out very user friendly um, it's very much designed for businesses who perhaps don't know where to begin uh, so this is another area you can go if we don't have anything immediately that can assist um, and it will look at the four pillar strategy we we just mentioned this because it's your consideration kind of moving forward you can do this formally or informally but of course reducing your own emissions and then your value chain is kind of a key area at the moment, getting the supply chains cleaned up. But then beyond that, in integrating it into your long term business strategy. And finally, that that ripple effect you have on your kind of uh, counterpart competitors, um, you know, and and customers influencing society. Real important one there in your transition to net zero. Signing up to the SME Climate Commitment is something we would also implore you to do. This again, life beyond low carbon. Um, everyone will be doing this soon and you will have to make this commitment uh, sooner or later. Um, I'm very much of the opinion if you're going to be forced to do something, you may as well just volunteer to do it. And at least then you can always say for all the future, you didn't do it through force, you did it by choice. And I think that in your long term legacy, um is a much better sell this isn't anything that should intimidate you can sign up on the website on the sme climate hub that's what we've done at bbf it's what many of the applicants have done through low carbon 
but also businesses we've engaged with through our net zero MK, net zero books programs, all the other programs we've kind of run alongside low carbon. So it's worth signing up to that. Um, a BBF engage, we have, you know, a lot of stakeholders in the room. We have a lot of people and real give unlimited thanks to you within these areas who have helped us promote um, the scheme. You can see we've got kind of all the logos of the, the bottom of a lot of our partners, but it goes far beyond that. We've really had such enthusiasm at pushing this and you can see where this has been taken up, the pockets it's been taken up more in and the impact the stakeholders in those areas have had. So thank you so much uh, for doing that. Just as a reminder, really, we've supported environmentally over 3,600 businesses in the past 14 years, 14,000 tonnes annually of CO2 e, um, and over 8 million direct to businesses. We will continue on this mission. Um, it's something that we now, as I said, we're permanent, so uh, we aren't going anywhere. So I would say um, if you have any queries, questions, any worries, any concerns, you know, this spectrum is so wide when it comes to the environment that you'll think, well, yeah, but my problem's really unique. Approaches with it. We're really encouraged and interested to see what it is and we could work it out together, I'm sure. So um, you won't be kind of uh, different in, in that in that in that result. Um, lastly, this is kind of um, and if anyone needs to drop off, I know people have an 11 o'clock. So that's absolutely fine. Just quickly, um, <clears throat> we what we'll be doing moving forward. This is this is how we're helping businesses. We set of advice. We work with our partners effectively to deliver a carbon calculator, which businesses can um, access and we work with. We give a specialist where you work one on one with us uh, under our programs and we can take you through this process, take out all the difficulty, take out the science elements. We teach you as you go, but it is not arduous. We teach you in a practical way. We don't want to be an obstacle. Uh, we know how busy everyone is and what pressures exist in the current climate. We want to complement that and not be a problem. But further to that, we'll this in turn will feed out lovely uh, reductions to make um, data, graphs, so that you can kind of see your pattern, uh, but also reductions you can make. And using your data, it will feed through what those reductions are. So we've got some real clever systems here with our partners that we're using. So um, again, if this is something you're interested stakeholders in, or you think, actually, we need something like this, please, please get in, get in touch with us. Uh, last and not least we have the net zero collaboration circle this is on linkedin we are building it up and we are going to go out of the area a bit more because we know we've got so many supporters now across the field that we want you all to be part of the conversation so feel free to scan that there um and i think we we're coming to the end here um so thank you so so much uh for everyone who stayed on the call yeah we've kept most of you i'm really happy about that um it's 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 brilliant quite happy for any final questions we may have um but i would also uh, just again thank all the stakeholders thank all the businesses that have taken part uh in the scheme and importantly thank my team who've really really um hopefully some of you have had the experience of working with them individually and actually the steps they take, the meaningful steps they tried to thank you for the applause, uh, the uh, steps they've taken to assist businesses beyond the grant, beyond what we were originally intending to do, but because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and they've done that. So that's Tom McDonald, uh, Mike King, who's currently um, he's out of the country. I think he planned that very well for the end of this programme to leave the country. Uh, we've got Ab Mamidou, He's been with us a couple of years and he's make sure everything works in the background. And we've also had some brilliant support from Brian Hughes, a temp with us, but uh, she's certainly uh, certainly helped us in our uh, final moments, that's for sure. And Megan, of course, for putting the event on today for us and making sure it runs smoothly. Um, right, Megan has put a survey in. Please, honestly, if you could do anything for me, it would be that you'd complete that survey. If you say good stuff, great. If you say bad stuff, we really don't mind. We really want to know what you want, what you need, what's important to you. Um, so share it. If there's something we can do better, we want to know, but we just want to know. So 
please, if if you could uh, complete that survey, we'd be really glad. We'll also send it out in email, but um, you know, you'll never forget if you click it now. Uh, is there any final questions uh, that anyone has? No, Megan, that is fine. If anyone wants anything, please feel free uh, to reach out at any time. We're here. We're not going anywhere. Uh, yes, and we're always happy for the conversation. Uh, and thank you to the panelists who, of course, were brilliant, made me look better. Uh, OK, everyone. Well, thank you so much. I'm seeing some thank thumbs so up much. there. Yeah, I love that. Thank you very much, everyone. See you later. Have a nice weekend. Bye bye.